Mentorship to me, to me that's the most, the best thing you can actually do. I provide mentorship to young people as well as adults. I've seen many of those young people unfortunately become victims of violent crime and far too many of them are now deceased as a result of that. Hey man. Hey, how you doing? Not good. Not good. It's not a good situation, man. Not a good situation. It wasn't God, mother, that took your son. It was that evil act called gun violence. And tomorrow would be 20 years since he got shot. So, you know, certain times of the year it just and certain days it just it just affects you more than others. Recently the 13 year old in Hartford overdose. It it made me really like front page news. Brother Carl. Hey, hey, you recognize people? Yes. My baby Nick Alva, he died May 15, 2006. He was 15 years old. I know, I know Nick. This is not a movie. It's reality. I ain't even right rap. I was planning on how I was gonna get back to this motherfucking money. Uh, we need more Narcan for the trap. We need more Narcan for the trap. Narcan for the trap. Two white licks passed out in the back. We need more Narcan for the trap. Narcan for the trap. Might lose one off this batch if we don't get more Narcan in this trap. Uh, we need more Narcan in the trap. We need more Narcan in the trap. Uh, this ain't what the clowns like. The black thoughts so fat and all, this is what it would sound like. As we all know, there are a lot of people in our city that have been doing hard work year after year after year to save lives, to try to break the cycle of violence, to try to help build a safer community and safer streets. And uh, that includes, first and foremost, those community partners like uh, our Communities of Care, Moms United Against Violence, Compass Peace Builders, uh, who are out there working every single day. My name is Andrew Woods. I'm the executive director of Hartford Communities That Care. We provide case management support. We connect, connect folks to clinical services, therapy. We connect them to mental health, uh, mental health and clinical services. We also connect them to other services such as medical providers that can help them with the physical side of things. My name is Carl Hardrick. They call me BC, Brother Carl, before computers. Some say before Christ. I grew up in Hartford. I was born here. My mother was born here and her mother was born here. So I kind of have a, a history of Hartford in terms of what my parents and what I've been getting from them and what we used to see. And I watched that transition, you know, from what it was to what it is now. Know what it used to be, and, and the question was, could it still be that? Beautiful city, industrial, uh, four theaters, we can go places, look at it today, fast forward. Those things, resources are not there. The playgrounds are not there. The centers are not there. But raising from it, we're very poor. And recognize how do we survive the project of Bellevue Square? We depended on each other. Inside the Wilson Gray YMCA, the face of change on full display. It's the face of Brother Carl Hardrick, a leader who spent decades working on violence prevention efforts in the capital city. How do we address crime and not run from it, but run to it? And what are the tools that we need? Those questions now being asked on a bigger level at the Brother Carl Hardrick Institute. The Resource Center is training neighbors as violence prevention professionals who can work with victims, families, and perpetrators. Primarily their job is to, when it comes down to at-risk youth primarily, making sure that those young people have interveners in their lives, mentors in many respects, that can actually meet them where they're at.
My name is Brian Evans, and I'm a employment specialist slash mentor. I'm doing a little bit of everything from, you know, conflict resolution to, you know, just trying to make sure that they're succeeding in whatever they're doing, whether it be school or at home. My main two goals are, you know, to keep them safe and to keep them alive. The work that we do at HETC and MOAB does like this community, this healing community is is needed, hopefully to stop or get ahead of um, what happens. My name is Roman Carter. Uh, growing up in uh, Hartford, Connecticut, I am actually a uh, lieutenant in um, the Hartford Fire Department. Um, growing up here all my life, West Indian background. I feel like growing up in Hartford, you either know someone who's been shot shot at or you've been shot or shot at. Um, I've been shot, I've been stabbed, I've been, you know, in plenty of fist fights, gotten jumped, um, plenty of experiences, like I said, but to us it's normal. I, I would assume probably one out of three kids in Hartford knows somebody who's been shot, stabbed, you know, killed. My son was murdered. When a mother or father lost, lose a child and they only son at that, it takes a lot out of you. So if I can help in the community to keep it from happening to another parent, then I would get on board with that to help the violence from escalating up, trying to prevent violence from happening. I lost a brother in 2010 on Edgewood Street. He was shot 17 times. I lost a, a son September 17th. He was shot on Durham Street. He was pistol whooped and shot. And I miss my brother and my son every day. Every single day. If it bleeds, it leads. And so what I've come to know to this day to this day, that the media in urban areas, when they come down here, is less likely because there's something great going on. It's more likely to continue to elevate and promote what's wrong. If you keep seeing that over and over again, that, that affects you. If you can't look at the news and go, okay, so another person lost their lives due, due to gun violence, I don't care who you are, you're going to be, be impacted by that. It's, it's the constant, it's the roll of tape that keeps going and going. Some developing news on a Hartford grandmother shot and killed her own home. This car is live with the last night's arrest of Sam Hustin. 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 Being Hartford born and raised in the city has been good for me. Cultural factor that in terms of uh, the street life. But this dynamic, the psychosis that, evolved, that has evolved over a period of time frightens me. I saw weapons on the streets of Hartford. One was known as a calico, I think it was. Calico. It shoot 50 rounds or 20 rounds. Had no redeeming social value. As a reporter in the street, my source have led me to this weapon. On the streets of Hartford. No redeeming social value. I saw it all. The, the whole dynamic from from being in. A, I felt like I was a. I felt like I was a uh, war correspondent on the home front. I saw these things that were in certain communities, our community, here in Albany Avenue. Tell you to live in a war zone that we can stop from being a war zone. All we have to do is police our own community. Have the police police our community. If you know somebody who took somebody's life, why the hell do we let them walk up and down the earth like they have the power over us? We lose kids every single day in our neighborhoods. Some of them, if we didn't do the visual, they wouldn't be remembered or they'd just be forgotten. But we let the families know that their loved ones matter too, their lives matter too. Even the younger kids going to school or being exposed to gun violence or blood on the streets. They need to have more resources in here so that that kind of stuff doesn't happen so that when these kids go to school, they got a counselor on hand. They, you know, they're getting the services that they need so that they can deal with this. The only thing that's bad about Hartford is the violence that we allow to happen. And I say we allow to happen because we can't rely on the police to police us out of the situation in Hartford. 
it has to go back to the people in the community. Oh, yeah. If you just give them the Lord. right word, Amen. it can change that mindset. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. I was shot uh, at the age of 22 when I first got out of the military, first night home, I got shot. A lot of people don't understand how angry you get, how frustrated you get. And I was a veteran, being a black man, you without that, uh, that would be things, resources there for me. But those resources wasn't there. It's like they wasn't offered. Listen, the saddest time in my life was when that three-year-old boy got killed over on Garden Street. More heartbreaking news to bring everyone. A three-year-old has been killed in a drive-by shooting that happened in Connecticut. Police say the child was inside of a car in Hartford with his mother, two brothers and sisters, and a man believed to have been the intended target. A stolen car pulled up, driven by someone who opened fire, and then that vehicle sped off. That was the hardest time for me seeing a baby, senseless murdered for no reason. Uh, then uh, with the 14-year-old that was killed on the same day, that was the worst day for me. I told you we do the cleanups, right? So, you know, when we did the cleanup on Barber Street, we also cleaned up uh, Martin Street, right? That was on a Saturday. On Sunday is when that 17-year-old was killed. You know what I'm saying, Brother yeah, Woods? That's right. So, one day everybody was clapping and happy to see, oh, young people doing something positive. Next day, on a Sunday, 17-year-old gone. So, and he lived right there. I think everybody does recognize that uh, problems as deep as gun violence uh, here in Hartford, but in cities across the country, uh, can't be solved by police alone. Uh, and frankly, they can't be solved by uh, by youth programs or sports programs alone. The, the problems that give rise to gun violence are complex. They are deep. They are longstanding. Uh, they are rooted in uh, layers of, of trauma and loss. Uh, and that's why it takes an entire community. I've lost a nephew to gun violence. Um, and and let's, let's just, uh, I'll start there. You know, when we talk about loss, is that um, that was probably that that was the single most challenge that I've out, that I faced in terms of watching and knowing that I have a nephew who was killed to gun violence, and this was even after I had already started doing the business of trying to prevent gun violence, only to have your own nephew be murdered, much like Brother Kyle to have his grandson to be murdered. Hartford police returning to Amherst Street Wednesday morning, where 19-year-old Makai Buckley was shot and killed Memorial Day. Brother Carl Hardrick, a longtime violence prevention activist in Hartford and mentor to countless youth in the city, is Buckley's grandfather, a man who has spent years consoling other families who've lost loved ones to violence. When someone said, you need to hurry up, someone said, Brother Carl, you need to hurry up and get to the hospital. I got kind of worried because I know what that means. Hurry up, man, it doesn't look good. What's going on, gentlemen? All right, all right. Uh, they, they, come, they come to get a few words from you on, on the importance, the importance of why brothers like me and love Joy need us out here. Oh, man, listen, man. I don't, I don't know why he has a camera. He has a camera. Because he want to talk to the man right here. That's right. Why, why, why are my big brothers are needed here in the community? Yep. Because, listen. It's a job that needs to be done. I mean, um, everybody not going to step up and do it. Um, let me tell you, uh, this is a good community. We got a lot of good people, a lot of people getting hurt. Uh, just need some change. So somebody got to step out front and start the change. And once you show that you're putting forth effort, everybody else jump on and 
try to do what they can do. So I appreciate the work that the brothers do. All year, every year for the last 10, 15, 20 years, whatever it may be. Oh, that's you. I admire both my brothers for the work they do, and I want you to continue doing it. Because listen, uh, it's needed. Our little sisters and brothers, you know, we gotta make a change in this neighborhood. And it's in the whole country, but in this neighborhood as a whole, you know, it's, it's, it hurts when you hear about some violence going on and you kind of, some attachment, something, maybe a customer, a cousin, somebody's cousin, somebody's brother. Last night. Yeah, last night. Last um, night. Right there. Last night. Huh? Bobber and uh, Nelson. Bobber and Nelson, that man? This is getting ridiculous. What, what we are seeing now is the absence of the father figure in the household. Uh, I, I think that's why you see so much violence now. It's because there's no love, because you never know, would show love. You know, uh, moms love you, but the person that you want to love from and to hug from was your father. And if he's not there, then you're not going to get it from anybody else. And what I try to do is, I try to tell them, I love you anyway, coming from a father figure. I'm not your father, but I am, you are my son. As far as it, as far as it go for me being important, I think, you know, just bonding with my son and spending time with him and showing him that, you know, dad's here, you know, giving him that sense of belonging, you know, I think that's, that's uh, very important. I can't be trying to save these kids all day, every day, and then let mine slip through the cracks, you know what I'm saying? Right back to that breaking news now in Hartford. We know that one person is dead and two others were hurt after a late night triple shooting on Winter Street. Unfortunately, a 23 year old man is dead and two other men are currently in the hospital after what police say was a targeted shooting. Now, investigators have just released the name of that 23 year old victim, Brian Evans of Hartford. And as of now, the two other victims names have not yet been released, but we do know one is a man in his 20s who is in critical condition. The other a man in his 30s in stable condition. Now we are move that fucking chair. <laughs> I swear to God, you I swear to God. I swear to God. <laughs> passing of my older son, so, you know, I'm just trying to process that and, um, can't say I accept it, but I'm trying to just live with it and, um, it's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of anger, but, um, try not to be bitter. I get all, all a little PTSD symptoms, like the anxiety, you know, just, just everything, like, but it's just like, damn, everywhere you go, you know, because just even speaking to those two real important people to me, I lost my brother right there on Mada, you know, and then I lost my son right there on Winter Street, and I damn near grew up, my aunt owned a house right across the street from where my son was killed at, so, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, damn, my mom got married right there at 10 and a half Winter Street in 78, and my son, died on the ground directly outside, like, can't go nowhere without blessing yourself, pouring out a cup, lighting a candle, stopping to see if somebody mom still lit there. You know, it just all come back to you and it, and, it, and it hit you like a rush because you relive that every time. So just think, if I go to the hood every day, I'm reliving each one of those murders, each one of those moments every time. So guess what? I stay out of the hood as much as I could. You know what I mean? I want to thank you again, oh God, for the 23 years that Brian had with his family. Well, here's what I've been standing, and your mercy and grace to the folks that are gathered here today, oh God. We pray for the old ones, the young ones, and the new ones, oh God, that you, God, will touch them in a mighty way, Father God. Lord, let the word that was said here today resonate to God. Let people go home with a new, renewed mind, oh God. Let them go home wanting to help you, God, and be there for one another. 
You said in your word that we got to love one another. How can we love you, God, the spirit we never see? And we can't lay you and love our brothers and sisters who we see every day. So now, God, as we close this prayer, we lift up for these families. We lift up our children. We lift up our neighborhood. And we say to you be the glory, God. But God, we need you to come down now, God, and bring your peace, your healing, and your comfort to this family right now as they go through the difficult time, oh Lord. You said, God, in your word, if we ask in your son Jesus' name, God, it will be given. Now, God, we're asking in Jesus' name, oh God, for your peace and for your justice for this mother and that family and for this father and his family. So now, God, if we close this prayer, we give you all the glory, all the praise, because you alone, God, is worthy to be praised. In Jesus' name, amen. When you live in a neighborhood like we live in, You don't want to think that that would happen to your child. And you do everything you can to protect them. And it still catches you. I grew up uh, in North Hartford, uh, starting on Mother Street, uh, 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 migrating over to a place called Nelton Court. Uh, over on North Main Street, and uh, then from there uh, to the Blue Hills community um, as a teenager for the rest of my life. What moved me uh, to the extra lens to gun violence was it was one uh, 2012 when my son was murdered to gun violence. We are hearing the 20 year old victim of a shooting on South Prospect Street has died. Shots were fired around four this afternoon at the Sheldon Oak Apartments, while neighbors say children have been playing outside. Neighbors say two men have been arguing that it turned violent. Police say the victim was shot in the side, the other man took off, and the EMT picked up the victim who was on a patch of grass near the sidewalk. When our children fall on the corners, uh, by gun violence when their brain matter is spread all over the sidewalks of their homes and their communities. Uh, we get a brief story. Uh, people start to say they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. How can you be in the wrong place at the wrong time when you live there? We have held anti-violent marches and rallies, attended by hundreds of people from Harford and other communities in Connecticut, carrying 300 crosses and bearing the name of victim lost to gun violence. We also gathered in prayer vigils, requested by the families, Working in coalition with similar groups to ours in New Haven and Hartford and Bridgeport, we are witnessing the pain and grief of mothers and families who mourn the death of their innocent young people gunned down in Connecticut's inner cities. Mothers and families of our organization can't be here today because of work and family responsibilities. If they were here, they would say, we don't want any other families to pay dues we have paid to belong to this organization. We grieve with all those who have felt the personal impact of gun violence in our community, urban and suburban. And we say to them, no one knows your pain and grief better than Mothers United Against Violence. I want to introduce to you a man that has a great meaning in my life. Um, past year, we have been connected by what he called to the hip. On um, October the 20th, 2012, he lost a 20-year-old son to gun violence. I would like to present to you Reverend Sam Sayer. Good afternoon. I'm the father of a slain young man, a son who on the 20th of October 2012 became the 20th victim in the city of Harford, killed by a 20-year-old at the age of 20. It was a beautiful day for me, but it became a day when I learned about the cost of living. As a pastor, I enjoyed our annual cake fest, and we enjoyed it. And I, I was so feeling so good, I went home and I was going to retire to sleep until I caught a, caught a call from his mother, a frantic call that says Shane is gone, Shane is gone. They took my baby away. My mind had to catch up with the words. I didn't want to hear it. I rushed to the hospital to find my son laying lifeless on a bed. I prayed to God, I tried to get 
one of those Lazarus experiences. I felt as though I paid my tithes, I was a pastor, I dedicated my life to God, I had favor with God. I needed a favor from God that day. God didn't deliver a favor that day. He didn't answer my prayers that day. I was left with anger and disappointment in the God that I had so much hope in. You know why I had to go this way. Just two weeks earlier, I told Reverend Brown, I'm getting off of this parade of pain. Woman bashed it with her head bashed in, left lifeless on the side. I didn't want to see this anymore. Couldn't understand it. And here I am now in the middle of it, understanding the pain of a father and a mother, the loss of a mother, loss of a father. It is a pain I hope none of you ever experience. None of you ever go to a sifting situation where you're left lifeless while still living. But here we are today. You know, my son's 10th anniversary, he came up in October, October 20th. Um, and, uh, and so we, we had our family and friend uh, moment, uh, you know, uh, at the site of the shooting. And, um, you know, it wasn't any press there, wasn't any fanfare, uh, no lowered flags uh, by the state for him. And we just came together and prayed and remembered him. Talked of the fond times that we, uh, that we shared with him when he was alive. The healing process is, many people think that there, there's a healing process. Uh, that it's really an acceptance process. You, you don't heal from a hole that can't be replaced. What your loved one doesn't want you to do or don't want to happen is two victims out of that shooting, them and you, you know, and some parents have taken their lives, some parents have gone into alcohol or drugs, you know, to be able to handle the, the loss, the hole in their life. So the goal is to be, try to be resilient and find some streak of, uh, of, of resiliency that allows you to uh, honor that person's life, uh, you know, uh, in some action. You begin to see the ongoing, almost daily, uh, shootings that take place inside urban centers that has an impact on folks that, quite frankly, doesn't allow them an opportunity to even recover from the first one or the previous one or the previous one. So it's not just about um, an individual that's been directly impacted. It has an impact on the entire community. You know, you think about a young child who continues to hear gunfire in their community and how that increases their anxiety, how it increases uh, their inability to make meaningful connections with other family members or even community members because, quite frankly, it limits their trust level. It limits their ability to even engage with people out in the community in ways that typically uh, young people should be engaged in folks, having fun, um, enjoying relationships. Uh, learning about other people and so forth. But when you have folks that are confined to their homes or afraid to go out of their homes, whether that's the parent or the child themselves, urban gun violence has an impact to where it basically reduces people's ability or, or basically limits people's interest in going out primarily because of safety reasons and then being continuously exposed to traumatic situations. There is not a deep understanding or appreciation of what violence and poverty does um, to you, both emotionally, physically, from you know the perspective of brain development, uh, it changes you. Brian is a worker against gun violence, such as I. I mean, you out there, we're out there pressing the flash, trying to move the agenda and keep it out of our households. And it, and it comes in our household. It, it comes up in our household. And so while we don't have full control, as you know, 10 years later, tens of thousands of kids have lost their life. You could only tell him that you got to reach for a, a, a greater hope. Um, you know, we all, we all grieve different. We all mourn different. They're not doing that guilt thing like, oh, I did this, I did, oh, I should not, nah, I ain't doing that. One day at a time. Just that simple. Not easy, but one day at a time.
Information, Hartford police have now identified a man killed in an overnight homicide. 23-year-old Jose Rodriguez of Manchester was found in a gruesome scene at the corner of Canton and Donald Street. Police say Rodriguez had been shot and was hanging out of the passenger door of a stolen car. Officers could not tell how long that car was at the scene. They're not even sure if the crime happened at that intersection. However, they say this was clearly a targeted attack. It is the 39th homicide of the year. The violence now reaching levels that hasn't been seen in years. I ain't even right, rap. I was planning on I was going to get back to this motherfucking money. Uh, we need more Narcan for the trap. We need more Narcan for the trap. Narcan for the trap. Two white licks. Passed out in the back. We need more Narcan for the trap. Narcan for the trap. Might lose one off this batch if we don't get more Narcan in this trap. Narcan in the uh, trap. We need more Narcan in the trap. We need more Narcan in the trap. Narcan in uh, the trap. This ain't what the clowns like. If Black Thought's so fat and all, this is what it would sound like. Gotta find this fee off a of veteran hooker. Left her out in Phoenix, cause I let my cousin Devin book her. We could've lost Benny at that Walmart. I was worried about my friend. Y'all was thinking about a false start. We still gonna turn rap into nice houses. Pioneering that like the first black at the White Fountain. Told Poppy, send fat too. I'm exploring options. Line full of fiends look like Jordan's dropping. You niggas either got a mistake or a crew joke. I was wise enough to learn from what you fools spoke. She stalked me on the gram where she really could know me. My top five, he and me, Rick, Benny, and Sholey. Shout mama on that 10 year sobriety chip. I hope my bullshit ain't the reason her sobriety slip. We need more Narcan for the trap. We need more Narcan for the trap. 